The Catechism of the Council of Trent, great work edited by St. Charles Borromeo and published by order of St. Pius V, says that priests, quote, can never think they have bestowed sufficient labor and attention on the explanation of the sacrament of baptism, close quote. It points out we should make baptism a frequent topic of instruction. Well, baptism replaced uh, circumcision. It's been just over a year since we've uh, reviewed baptism. So this morning, we're going to review the merciful effects of baptism and also how to do an emergency baptism. It's essential for everybody to understand those things. We'll start with a little story I've told before because I think it makes a good point. I took this out of the journals of a pioneer priest who was working in Miles City, Montana in the 1880s, so when it was Montana Territory. Here's from his journals. Quote, I will relate one more genuine full-blooded baptism. Robert Cobb Matthews, born of Robert Matthews and wife Mary Jane McCann, baptized July 31st, 1881. Sponsors Edward Flynn and Bridget Johnson. Resident Matthews Ranch, 20 miles below the junction of the Missouri and Yellowstone Rivers in North Dakota. They traveled 10 days and a half horseback, carried their provisions and oats for the horses and a tent for the night. They said it would take as long to go home as it did to come. It took 21 days of travel to get that baby baptized. This was during the Sioux War. They were constantly in danger to be met by Indians, to be robbed of all they had, to be murdered, and their bodies left for the wolves to devour. Close quote. 21 days of travel. That that country's still rough. I mean, you still, that'd be a rough trip right now to do that horseback, that distance. And, you know, you can stop in places on the way now. It's 21 days. Think of the sacrifices this young couple were willing to go to to get that child baptized. Thankfully, we don't have to travel 10 and a half days to get through a wilderness quarreling with war parties and whatnot to get a priest. But it ought to give us pause to think about the incredible value that Catholics have traditionally put upon getting a child baptized in a timely fashion, okay? As the Catechism of the Council of Trent states, quote, Since infant children have no other means of salvation except baptism, we may easily understand how grievously those persons sin who permit them to remain without the grace of the sacrament longer than necessity may require. Close quote the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Now, sometimes people think, well, it's been updated. Nothing's been updated. Here's the instruction on infant baptism approved by Pope John Paul II on October 20th, 1980. Quote, for infants, baptism is entering to the church in the gateway to personal salvation. The church knows no other way apart from baptism for ensuring children's entry into eternal happiness. Accordingly, it is important to recall that the baptism of infants must be considered a serious duty. As for the time of the actual celebration, the indications and the ritual should be followed. The first consideration is the welfare of the child that may not be deprived of the benefit of the sacrament. As a rule, an infant should be baptized within the first few weeks of birth. Close quote. As a rule, an infant should be baptized within the first weeks after birth. Those who excessively delay the baptism of infants gravely sin. In other words, don't delay baptizing your baby. Don't delay, even if everybody can't be there, you get the kid baptized, and later on you can have the party, okay? The first point is don't delay. In the ritual itself, the godmother holds the baby when it's being baptized. Why? Because back in the day, when in Christendom, as soon as the baby was born, they'd take it and take off for the church. The, the, the woman's still in bed, the mother, the godmother would take it down and get him baptized and then bring him back. That's, and we still see that expressed ritually at that point in it. The church sees it as important. That's the only way for babies to be saved. Now, of course, when you're older, when you, when you reach the age of reason, and we'll talk about that a different day, we don't have the time to go through it, but there is baptism of desire and baptism of blood. That's what we're talking about here. A baby can't have a baptism of desire, okay? Unless he's explicitly killed, like the holy innocents were for Christ, unless he's explicitly killed, he doesn't get the baptism of blood either, okay? So we've got to get the babies baptized quick. That's the first point. Now let's review six merciful effects of baptism. First merciful effect is the remission of sins. Baptism remits original and actual sin. 
the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent. Quote, if anyone denies that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is conferred in baptism, the guilt of original sin is remitted or that all sin is not taken away, let him be anathema, close quote. So baptism remits all the guilt of original sin and all the guilt of actual sin, all of it. Every bit of it, it's all gone. If somebody was an unbaptized mass murderer, literally a mass murderer, they got baptized, it's gone, just like that. All of it, the original sin and all the actual sins. Of course, a baby hasn't committed actual sin, but it still has original sin. But when an adult gets baptized, everything prior to that point is gone. So that's the first uh, merciful effect, remission of all sin, original, actual. Second merciful effect, baptism remits all the punishment due to sin. All of it. There's not one speck of purgatory time left. We do penance after we get washed clean in the confessional, but no one does penance after baptism. Go back to the mass murderer. You have some mass murderer. He's on death row. He decides to, he's, he's been a, a heathen his whole life. He decides, I want to get baptized. He gets baptized. He's clean. Nothing, no purgatory, nothing. It's all gone. It's fantastic. So that's the second merciful effect. Third merciful effect. The soul of the newly baptized man is flooded with sanctifying grace. That's another way of saying that the soul of the newly baptized man is now supernaturally alive. He now has supernatural life. Remember that in order to live the life of heaven, we have to be supernaturally alive. If we die supernaturally alive, which is the same as saying if we die with sanctifying grace, which is also the same as saying if we die in the state of grace, we can live the life of heaven. If we die without it, We can't live the life of heaven. Remember this. We have to burn that in our minds. If we die with sanctifying grace, if we die, we're supernaturally alive. We can get to heaven, and we can live there if we get there. If we die without it, we can't. Okay? And, thanks to Adam, when we're born, supernaturally speaking, we're all born dead. What does baptism do? Baptism makes us supernaturally alive. It floods our soul with sanctifying grace. So that's the third merciful effect. The fourth merciful effect... The soul of a newly baptized man is now united to Christ. Our whole religion is all about having a living contact with Christ our Lord. That's why he set up his church. It's so we can have contact with him. And baptism puts us into that contact with him. It starts then. The soul of a newly baptized man is united to Christ. And through that union with Christ that's now been established, the supernatural virtues are poured in. Supernatural virtues, these are virtues beyond our nature. Supernatural virtues like faith, hope, charity, supernatural prudence, supernatural justice, supernatural fortitude, supernatural temperance. Sanctifying grace changes the way we are, it changes our being. But these supernatural virtues change the way we act. It gives us the power to do acts that are beyond our ability as mere men. I use this example a lot because we can see it. We don't think about it sometimes, but we can see it. By the power, the supernatural power of faith, we can believe there are certain men that can take pieces of bread and whisper words to those pieces of bread, and that bread becomes a man, and that man is God. Now, that's not obvious. We believe that because we got this gift in our baptism, this gift of faith, that we can believe in the real presence, that our Lord is really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the most blessed sacrament altar. We believe that. As certainly as we believe we're here and alive, we believe it with the most certain certainty because God says so. But we don't believe that of our own nature. We believe that because he's given us a supernatural power. We've been put in contact with Christ, and in that contact, he's given us the ability to believe things that are naturally not possible to believe. So the fourth uh, merciful effect is we get these virtues poured into us by that unity, union with Christ. Okay. Fifth merciful effect. Baptism impresses upon the soul an indelible mark called a character. It's a spiritual mark that can be never blotted out. It can never be blotted out. If we go to hell, it'll be there. Please, God, we won't go. If we go to heaven, it'll be there. This supernatural mark can never be blotted out. It's like a spiritual brand that marks us with the sign of the cross. Okay, What does this do? The character of baptism gives us a new capacity. It makes us capable of receiving the other sacraments in a fruitful manner. This is why Our Lady was baptized. She didn't have original sin. 
She didn't have actual sin, but she was baptized to get that character impressed into our soul. According to Lapidus, says, according to the ancient fathers, Christ our Lord himself baptized the Blessed Virgin Mary and baptized St. Peter. The character impressed on a baptized soul makes that baptized soul different from those who don't have it. It's Again, it's kind of like a spiritual brand showing this person is a Christian. Because it's got an indelible character, it can never be repeated again. It's once for all. So the saints in heaven that weren't baptized, like St. Moses, for example, he doesn't have this character in his soul. But we do. And hopefully we'll get there. It makes a difference in heaven, too. Anyway, sixth merciful effect. Because baptism removes original and actual sin, and the punishment due to sin, it opens the gates of heaven. Okay? So, quick review. The six merciful effects of baptism are, first, it remits original and actual sin. Second, it remits all the punishment due to sin. So there's no purgatory time for anything done before baptism. Third, the soul becomes supernaturally alive. It's flooded with sanctifying grace. Fourth, the soul is united with grace. And in that union, it's filled then with supernatural virtues. They're poured in. Fifth, the soul is marked with its permanent character. It's indelible mark. And sixth, the gates of heaven are open for the newly baptized man. Okay, now that we've reviewed the merciful effects of baptism, it's easy to understand the infallible teaching of the Catholic Church explained by this following canon taken from the Council of Trent. If anyone saith that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let him be excommunicated. Why is it so necessary? Because we're born without supernatural life. We thank Adam for that. We're born supernaturally dead, but in order to live the life of heaven, in order to be saved, we have to be supernaturally alive, which means we have to be baptized, okay? Some other time we'll talk about what, how the baptism of desire, the baptism of blood fit into this. All right. Let's review then the basic aspects of baptism, which is to say we'll review the matter, the form, the minister, and the intention. When we're talking about a sacrament, if we know those four things, we understand the sacrament. Matter, form, minister, and intention. Okay, matter is the stuff. What's the stuff in baptism? It's water. Now, that can be natural water. It can be holy water. It can be baptismal water. You know, we make that every year at, at Holy Saturday, at the Vigil of Easter. We make uh, baptismal water. It can be river water. It can be pool water. It can be distilled water. It can be sink water. Not snow, not beer, uh, not spit, not amniotic fluid, not tomato juice, whatever. It's what we commonly regard as water. That's what we can use for baptism. That's what we use. Is what's commonly regarded as water. The form. That's the words. The form is, I bat- it's easy. If you know how to do the sign of the cross, you can do this because you add a few words in front. You say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in any language, whatever language is your native tongue, it's fine. I ba- you're saying, I baptize you in the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter. As long as you say it in that form, Okay. Minister. The minister is anyone who has the use of reason who intends to do what the church does. That's all the intention. Intention is pretty easy on a sacrament. You intend to do what the church does. Does that mean you understand it? No. Does that mean you believe it? No. This is so important, as we've just seen how important baptism is. This is such an important sacrament that Christ our Lord made it possible for anyone to baptize. Two pagans can baptize each other. We can't baptize ourselves. But two pagans can baptize each other and become Catholics. Two Jews can baptize each other. Two Muslims can baptize each other. Anybody can baptize that's reached the age of reason and has intention of doing what the church does. Someone could lay there and ask somebody who's definitely not a believer, doesn't want to be a believer, would you baptize me? Sure. If they're doing that because because you've asked them to, that's a baptism, and it'll work. All right. So even a pagan can baptize. All right. Let's review, then, how we should baptize in the case of emergency. By this, we mean the case of someone dying. First off, if someone's dying, you know, and you're at this emergency thing, don't wait for a priest to do this. Don't, you know, I mean, yeah, it's great stuff. I don't say don't call him, but don't wait. Get with the program. Don't wait. Anyone over the age of reason can do this. You need to intend to do what the church does. You need to intend to baptize a person if they're already not baptized. We'll have three cases here, and we'll be able to understand it from that. First, you come across a wreck. You're out in the country. Here comes a motorcycle. He missed the curve. Bang, he hits the fence. Uh, you know, it's a big mess, and he's unconscious, and he's dying. You're not sure 
if he's baptized. You don't know. You don't know him. So there he is, and he's dying. He's unconscious. Take, run up with the water, and while you're pouring it on the skin, you say the words. If you're capable, even if you'd forget the, the, those words, you mean to bap, it's called a conditional baptism, because if he's baptized, it won't be a baptism. If he's not baptized, and he's open to it, will be a baptism. So you're assuming, hey, he must want to be baptized, he's probably not baptized. So this is what's called a conditional baptism. You don't mean to baptize him if he's already baptized. Do you see what I mean? You don't have to have all this legal stuff. I'm just explaining to you so because people have questions. We've just answered it. You're intended to baptize him if he's not baptized. That works. I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The same person who's pouring the water has to say the words. It's not a joint effort. The minister of the sacrament has to be applying the matter and the form. It has to be one guy doing So one guy can't pour, another guy says the words. Nothing's happening if you do that, okay? The same person who pours has to say the words. If possible, you pour the water on the forehead. If the forehead isn't there, on skin somewhere, it can be on a wrist, it can be on a leg, it can be on the sole of his feet, it can be on the palm of his hand, on skin, not on hair. It has to flow. It has to move over the skin. That does not mean you have to have a river. If you only have a drop of water, just a little drop, you can't hardly get it to flow. You can push it as you're saying. You know, I mean, you can literally take that drop and move it along if that's what it takes. If you're down to that little water, do it. But the water is flowing while you say the words. Okay? All right. Even if all you have is a drop that dribbles down the forehead, that's sufficient. Okay. As the water is flowing, you have to say the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, or I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, any exposed sin, not on hair, any exposed skin. Okay. As the water is flowing, if you're capable, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the first case. Second case, miscarriage. Basic idea. Fill a a bowl with lukewarm water. Break open the sack that surrounds the little baby. You might not be able to see that. Obviously, if the baby's big enough, you break it up because you can see him and you baptize right on his forehead. You you don't want to waste time, but you don't have to panic. It'll be exciting, you know, and and depressing and all that stuff. But if you do this rightly, you're going to have a saint. Okay, so you open the sack. If the sack isn't opened, it's not a baptism. If you can't find it, then you then you just do the best you can. Just write that now. But if you find a sack that, you know, a lot of times will be the size of a marble or bigger, you just carefully open that sack because Junior will be in there. You might not be able to see him. Don't worry if you can see him. You're worrying about baptizing them, not if you can see them. Okay, so what do you do? Fill the bowl with lukewarm water. Break open the sack that surrounds a little baby. If it's not broken, there's not a baptism. Then put all this in and gently swirl it in the water. You put him into the water and swirl it. Then the water's flowing. And as you're swirling, you say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. If he's not there, it's a conditional baptism because you don't know. Uh, you don't know if his soul's still there. So I baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bowl of oak on water, open the little sack, gently swirl around in the water, and while you're swirling out, say, if you're capable, you don't have to say that, but you, you, you mean that. I baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how you baptize in the case of a miscarriage. And we will put out in the email, and we will have a, a handout. We give it out every year, and we'll have those available, you know, in the next uh, few weeks. So that's the second case, miscarriage. We've seen uh, uh, like a car wreck or someone, an adult dying. We've seen a miscarriage. Third, newborn baby in the hospital, uh, and it's your newborn. He's having problems or dying. It, not in the rest. If he's in the respirator, have the nurse take care of it and, and tell and you know or or call call somebody at that point. But a newborn in the hospital that's dying, your newborn. Okay, take a cotton ball, get it wet with lukewarm water. It doesn't have, you know, just so you have some water in it. Depending on how he's laying there, put the cotton ball on his forehead if he's kind of on one side or else on the temple because you don't want it running over him and just pooling up. So you, you put it like right here against the side of his temple if he's laying on his back, on his forehead, and you squeeze it out if he's laying on his side. So a drop or two moves. As you, and as you're squeezing it and that drop starts flowing across, you say, I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You squeeze this cotton bowl full of water, get it lukewarm water, I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. All right? He's baptized. He's baptized, just like that. And, and, you know, there's at least one child here who was in serious trouble. They had me come and do it. I want you to do it. But as soon as we baptize him, he got well, just like that. It happens. It's happened, I think, twice to me so far. 
I can't explain it. The good Lord can. We'll find out in the next life. But I mean, the minute you're done baptized, you, you, it, you know, the nurses all start going, hey, you know, and whatever. I just get out of their way. You, you come in there, you do your thing and get out. But uh, with you, do that. Now, if it's a dying newborn of anyone else, if it's a dying newborn, if he's actually dying, and only if he's actually dying, baptize him. In other words, don't go out and baptize perfectly healthy little heathen babies. Don't get this big project going with, with your, with your sister's kids or your cousin's kids or, you know, your best friend's kids. All the friends, we've all got friends that, that aren't living a good life. Fine. Don't baptize the little kids because you've turned them into Catholics and they're not going to be raised right. Don't do that. <laughs> this is only if they're dying. The missionaries never did that. When you read about the missionaries, they baptized the dying babies because they know, all right, he'll be all right. Because, you know, that's going to be all right. Just don't randomly baptize people, okay? That's really important. All right. If it's a dying baby, then baptize him. He'll be a saint. If needs be, you can give some little line about cleaning his forehead or whatever. Say the words so quietly that only you can hear. But get that little guy baptized. Don't let him die without it. He can't get into heaven without it. It's a salvation issue. Obviously, this is very important to understand for uh, physicians and and nurses and emergency uh, personnel, okay? You have a great responsibility here and a great opportunity to really uh, fill heaven. Okay, finally, how long after someone dies is it okay to conditionally baptize? Until obvious decomposition sets in. Don't worry if they're blue. Don't worry if they're blue. The soul might still be there. The late great father Hardin reported a case. He had been a hospital chaplain for like 25 years. He reports a case of a lady in Chicago who was blue and frozen solid for eight hours by the time she's brought in and somehow walked out of that hospital later on. If they're not visibly decomposing, you baptize them. You're not offending the good God. If they, you know, if so, now I don't mean to be gross, but if people, some, you get these calls and people are very distraught, like there's been a really horrible accident. If it's pieces, you can't baptize. The soul's not there. It, we're only taught, that's decomposed in a rapid way. I'm not trying to be rude or, or funny here. It's, 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 it's sad. But when there's really violent, violent accidents where people are, are, are torn up in, into pieces, we don't baptize pieces. This, we're talking somebody that isn't decomposed either naturally from, from the, just falling apart or not decomposed by some violent accident or something like that. Okay. So let's close. We've seen that the Council of Trent says, if anyone says that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let them be anathema. We've seen that for those under the age of reason, it's the only way for them to be saved. Huh? We've seen how to baptize in emergency while pouring water over the skin. The same person pouring the water says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Or while squeezing water out of a cotton ball, on the same person says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost.